Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox, and today I thought it might be a good day to read another chapter of Come As You Are, The Story of Nirvana by Michael Azarad. Michael was one of the few journalists that Kurt actually trusted. He befriended Kurt, he followed Kurt around on tour throughout 92 and 93. He interviewed multiple people, including Chris Novoselic and Dave Grohl, and all the family members and various friends from their childhood. It is a a chapter about Chris Novoselic. It is the same chapter that I used to make the last Nirvana history video about Chris Novoselic. So if you haven't watched that, chapter three. Chris Anthony Novoselic was born on May 16, 1965 in Compton, California. His parents, Chris and Maria, were Croatian immigrants. Mr. Novoselic, the name means new settler in Croatian, moved to the United States in 1963, his wife-to-be the following year. They set up house in Gardena, California, and Mr. Novoselic got a job driving a truck for Sparklet's drinking water. After moving around to a series of apartments with Chris and his younger brother Robert, they got a modest house and then another, nicer one, in 1973 when Chris's sister, Diana, was born. Although busing had been instituted in California and Gardena, kids of different races didn't mix, except for one group. There was the one scene with all of us who were in bonehead mats, says Novoselic. We were totally integrated. Whoever didn't really fit in all bonded together and there was no racial thing. So integration did work. Robert and I were kind of big boys and we used to get into trouble, says Chris of his preteen years. Slash tires, stuff like that. My dad would just have to whoop us because that's all he knew how to do. We were scared of him. But it wasn't like he was an abuser. I don't think he abused us at all. It's not like he would slap us for anything. It was action and reaction. Like Robert, he got glasses, and the first day he got his glasses, he busted them, Chris continues. That's just Robert. We'd just do shit like that. Go throw rocks at houses, throw rocks at cars. There was a time when vandalism was really cool. We really got into vandalism. Chris says he and his brother straightened out by the time the family moved to Aberdeen in 1979 when Chris was 14. Property values in Southern California were getting too high for the Novoselic family and they could get a nice house for a little money in Aberdeen. Besides, there were lots of other Croatian families in the area. Mr. Novoselic got a job as a machinist at one of the town's many lumber mills. After sunny California, Chris didn't like Aberdeen at all. It's got everything against it, he says. It's cloudy and rainy. There's mud in the streets from all the trucks. The buildings are all kind of dirty. It's like an East German town or something. Now keep in mind, Chris is talking about an East German town before that Berlin Wall came down. And interesting, Nirvana was playing a show the night the Berlin Wall came down and they even retrieved a rock, a, a piece of the wall, and kept it as a memento. It is a very historical occasion. Down with the communists, right? You know who else was there besides Nirvana the night the wall came down? The person person who was actually in charge of protecting the wall? Vladimir Putin. Back then he was just an officer. Everything is so damp down there that the wood just gets kind of soft and things fall apart. Like Kurt, Chris had a hard time at school because he didn't fit in. The California stereotype held true. Things really were mellower there. I was perplexed by the weird twisted social scene they had in Aberdeen, says Novoselic. It just seemed like people were a lot more uptight and a lot more judgmental. Aberdenians wore leather tennis shoes and elephant flares, while Chris sported deck shoes and straight leg Levi's. You were a geek if you wore straight leg jeans. Three years later, says Chris, everybody was wearing straight leg pants, and I suffered for nothing. They were making fun of him because in Aberdeen, they were still wearing bell bottoms, elephant flares, and they didn't understand his straight leg jeans, his sense of style. They did not realize that they were behind on the times. This reminds me of my fifth grade year. I went to a new school, a very rural redneck school, and my brother who grew up, my my stepbrother who grew up in Baton Rouge, big city, and would hang out in New Orleans, gave me a Ralph Lauren polo duffel bag. Okay, this is in fifth grade in the early to mid 90s. Now, Ralph Lauren ended up becoming a very expensive sort of preppy kind of logo that upper class people would wear at one point in time. But no one at this new school I went to had ever heard of Ralph Lauren. And they were like, ah, oh, look at his dirty, cheap book bag. What's that? Did you get that at Odd Lot? 
that's like these kids had no clue who the fuck Ralph Lauren was. Of course, later when I got into high school, I wouldn't give a shit about fashion at all. And I would just wear whatever, whatever rags were available. And he was very tall. He was six foot seven by the time he graduated from high school. His parents were hoping he'd become a basketball player, but his height only made Chris awkward. I was just weird and maladjusted more than anything else, Chris says. I was really depressed when I came up to Aberdeen. I couldn't get along with anybody. I'd go home and sleep all afternoon and listen to music by myself. I couldn't get along with those kids. They were assholes. They treated me really badly. I didn't understand. They just weren't cool. Chris was into bands like Led Zeppelin, Devo, Black Sabbath, and Aerosmith, while his peers were into Top 40, perhaps because that was all the local radio station played. They'd play Top 40 radio on the school bus, and Chris was forced to endure the sound of Kenny Rogers warbling Coward of the County over and over again. Again, sorry to interject, but God, this reminds me of those middle school years when I had to ride the bus to this redneck school and kids would be singing along to country music and I was just mentally in the fetal position like, God, I hate my life. Luckily, geography smiled on Chris Novoselic. His family's house was on Think of Me Hill, the tallest hill in Aberdeen, named because at the turn of the century, there was a big sign on the hill overlooking the town that advertised Think of Me Tobacco. So he got excellent radio reception. On clear days, he could get Portland, Oregon. He'd lie in his room depressed and listen to the hip Seattle rock stations on his clock radio for hours. By June of 1980, Chris's parents got so worried about his depression that they sent him to live with relatives in Croatia. Chris had picked up Croatian around the house and is still fluent in it. He loved living there. He made lots of friends and the schools were excellent. He even heard something there called punk rock and discovered the Sex Pistols the Ramones, and even some Yugoslavian punk bands. It didn't make too much of a dent, however. It was just music to me, Chris recalls. It didn't really mean anything to me. It was just music that I liked. After a year, his parents called him back home. I was just in a weird limbo, Chris says. He began drinking and smoking pot heavily. I've always been a big drinker, says Chris. When I drink, I just don't stop. I like to drink because you're in some weird cartoon land where anything goes. Your vision is blurry and nothing and everything makes sense. It's crazy. It's a different reality and a different world of consciousness. Chris became well known on the party circuit. You'd go to parties and people would be like, Hey Novi, what's up Novi? says Matt Lucan. They always knew him as the big wacky guy because he was always doing weird things. They just thought he was kind of weird. He'd go to parties and jump around. He had some people to hang out with, but he was hard pressed to call them friends. I hung out with them because I had nowhere else to go, says Chris. It was kind of odd and uncomfortable. He finally got a job at the local Taco Bell and threw himself into work, working every night and not socializing just saving money. By senior year of high school, he had bought a car, some stereo speakers, and a guitar. He took some lessons along with his brother Robert and told his teacher, Warren Mason, the same guy who taught Kurt, that he really wanted to play the blues. He quit after a few months and then woodshedded intensively in his bedroom, patiently working out the licks to old B.B. King records with his brother. Then, he met Buzz Osborne. Chris worked at the Taco Bell with a fellow named Bill Hall, whose principal claim to fame was that he had been expelled from Aberdeen High School for planting a pipe bomb in the greenhouse. When Hall got transferred to Montesano High, he met Buzz and Matt Lucan. One day, Buzz and Matt visited Hall at the Taco Bell, and there was this big, tall, doofy guy back there singing along to the Christmas carols they're playing on the Muzak. Lucan recalls, Chris mentioned that he played guitar, and later, Osborne called up and invited him to hang out in Montesano. They talked politics, and Osborne turned him on to some cool music, blazing music from the Vibrators, Sex Pistols, Flipper, Black Flag, Circle Jerks. It was like, wow, punk rock, says Novoselic marveling still. I just totally disavowed all this stupid metal. Ozzy Osbourne, Judas Priest, Def Leppard. It was just shit. I just could not listen to it anymore. It was crap. It had lost all its appeal for me. Sammy Hagar, Iron Maiden, I just didn't like it. I was still into Zeppelin and Aerosmith and stuff. Chris had gone through a prog rock phase. Yes, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer and their ilk. But in his favorite phrase, it never yanked my crank. Like Kurt, Chris had a delayed reaction to punk rock. It didn't really grab me right away because it sounded really live, says Chris. It took about a week into it and it finally grabbed me. I was listening to Generic Flipper and the record moved me. It was like art. This is art. 
it was so substantial. People pay credence to Led Zeppelin IV or the White Album, and this was the same thing, so that turned my life around. He began reading punk fanzines such as Maximum Rock and Roll, discovered political hardcore bands like MDC, Millions of Dead Cops, the same cassette Kurt Cobain would later be arrested with in his pocket, and read about everything from anarchism to animal rights. Then he discovered bands such as the Butthole Surfers, Minor Threat, and Husker Du. He and a bunch of friends would pile into Matt Lucan's Mammoth Blue Impala and drive up to Seattle to see punk rock shows. Two hours up, two hours back. Awed by the big city, they kept to themselves. Around this time, Chris's brother Robert brought his friend Kurt Cobain over to the Novoselic house. When Kurt asked about the racket emanating from the upstairs stereo, Robert replied, Oh, that's my brother Chris. He listens to punk rock. Kurt thought that was very cool and filed the information away. Chris graduated from high school in 1983. Soon after, his parents divorced. It was a rough enough time as it was, but he also had some plastic surgery done on his face. Doctors cut a small section of bone out of Chris's jaw and moved some teeth forward to correct a severe underbite. I looked like Jay Leno, he says. Lucan remembers stopping by with Osborne on the day of the operation. They rang the doorbell over and over again, but nobody answered. Then they tossed some pebbles at Chris's window. Just as we were ready to give up, says Lucan, the window slides open and he had this huge head. It was totally swollen up. He almost looked like a little fat oriental baby. It was like an elephant man coming up to the window. Chris was mad because they'd woken him up from his anesthetized sleep. His jaws were tightly wired shut, yet he still managed to communicate something to his friends. You fuckers, he cried. Chris's jaw was wired shut for six weeks. He still went out to parties, except he had to carry a pair of wire cutters with him in case he threw up or something got caught in his throat. He'd go out and get all fucked up, Lucan recalls. He'd be puking, and it would be draining through his wires. He said he never did have to cut them, but all the food was like milkshakes anyway, no solid food. Still, it was somewhat reckless of him. Then the swelling went down, says Chris, and I had a new face. One day, during his senior year in high school, he had been walking behind two junior girls in the hall who were raving about the album, Never Mind the Bullocks, Here's the Sex Pistols. Yeah, they're really great, he piped up. Shelley remembered him as a class clown type guy, always joking. They talked a little and made friends. Shelley was also friendly with Kurt and remembers him as a smartass who would delight in riling the redneck who sat next to him in art class. Kurt's mom boarded a friend of Kurt's for a while and Shelley knew his sister, who was old enough to buy beer. She'd go over to Kurt's house sometimes to find him and his friends getting very stoned and grooving to Led Zeppelin. Shelley dropped out her senior year and took a job at McDonald's and got her own $100 a month apartment on Market Street, across from the fire department. On her way to work, she would walk past the Foster Painting Company where Chris worked and she would stand and talk to him. She got his phone number and started calling him up. They had a lot in common. Shelley had been an oddball in school too, and by March 1985 they had started hanging out as friends at Shelley's apartment, listening to punk rock records and going to shows. Soon they started going out. Chris and Osborne briefly had a band with original Melvin's drummer Mike Dillard, with Chris on guitar and Osborne on bass. Chris played a punked up version of Sunshine of Your Love with members of the Melvins as the opening act of a Melvins Metal Church bill at the DNR Theater in Aberdeen. Metal Church would go on to open on tour for Metallica. Chris became the lead singer for the Stiff Woodies, the Melvin Satellite Project, whose revolving door lineup featured at various times Osborne, Crover, Lucan, a fellow named Gary Cole, and others, including drummer Kurt Cobain. We sounded just like the butthole surfers, Kurt claims. Chris was a flamboyant frontman, recalls Dale Crover. He wore this big, long, purple fringe vest, and he'd do all these big, high kicks, says Crover. It was hilarious. The Stiff Woodies played a few parties before going the way of all satellite projects, probably because Chris' vocal talents were at roughly the same level as his cameo at the beginning of Nirvana's Nevermind Territorial Pissings. Chris played bass in another Melvin satellite project, a mentor's cover band. His stage name was Phil ATO. Whoa, kind of interesting. Chris Novoselic and the Melvins played in a Mentors cover band. And then much later, as we all know, El Duce of the Mentors would claim that Courtney Love offered him $50,000 to murder 
Kurt Cobain. He had been laid off from his painting job by then and was collecting $55 a week unemployment. He usually slept in all morning and then hung out at the Melvin's practice space where the band rehearsed every afternoon. Gradually, Chris moved in with Shelly. Chris didn't hang out with the Klingons at the Melvin's practice space so much after that, preferring to spend most of his time with his girlfriend. They didn't have a TV or a phone, and they got everything from thrift stores. They had tie-dye curtains and listened to Cream and early Rolling Stones records. It was one of the greatest times of our lives, says Shelley. Everything was so new. Everything was so bright for us. It was the first time we'd been away from our parents, and the world was ours. It was really cool. One more interjection. I want to talk about my first apartment real quick, which was awesome, and it was decked out. I live in a college town, 40,000 rich ass college students. Even though I was a poor kid, at the end of the school year, when these kids graduate or go home or whatever, move on, they just take all their stuff and dump it out in their yards on the sidewalks. And people will literally just go around dumpster diving because these rich college kids throw away really awesome stuff. They don't care about it. My first apartment, I had everything furnished for free. Amazing furniture, computer, stereo, big screen TVs, dishes, throw rugs, anything you can imagine. I got it out of college kids' front lawns that they had just left there to rot. Noting that the Melvins were awarded the princely sum of $80 for a night's work, Kristen Kurt started a Credence Clearwater Revival cover band aptly named the sellouts. They figured CCR was country rock and therefore would go over well in rural Aberdeen. The band was Kurt on drums, Chris on guitar, and a fellow named Steve Newman on bass. Newman later lost his finger in a woodcutting accident. Sounds like Newman ended up uh, working at one of the many lumber mills in Aberdeen. They practiced at Kristen Shelley's house, but it only got as far as five or six rehearsals. They broke up after Kurt and Newman got into a big fight one day. Uh, they broke up after Kurt and Newman got into a big fight one day at Kristen Shelley's. They were sitting around drinking when Newman tried to attack Kurt with a vacuum cleaner. Kurt grabbed a two by four and brained his much larger opponent. This is why I'm always telling people Kurt Cobain was a sensitive guy. He could be very passive, but he was not somebody you wanted to fuck with. We get these stories passed down to us where Kurt is being bullied a lot at school and stuff but that's by groups I don't care who you are if a group of people mess with you there's really nothing you can do I'm saying one-on-one -on -one in a fight Kurt Cobain was not afraid to fight at all and he fought many times he was a sensitive guy but he wasn't a sissy boy. Although they had left high school behind, they still hadn't escaped Aberdeen and their provincial peers. It was your basic nowhere town, and these people considered it the center of the universe, says Matt Lucan. There were these bigwigs that were popular in high school who belonged to these little cliques, and it kind of carried over out of high school because everybody still hung out together. Small town mentality. Real narrow-minded people who looked at something they weren't used to as something bad. Kurt was really a victim, says Shelley. People wanted to beat him up. He was different from them. He wasn't a redneck and he liked his own music and people are afraid of that in a small town. You're different and you're the freak. We got all kinds of shit in Aberdeen. Chris was talking about socialism at a party once and these guys were talking about slitting his throat. These rednecks because they thought he was a communist. It was a scary atmosphere, especially back in 1985. In March of 1986, Chris and Shelley moved to Phoenix, Arizona in search of work. What happens is, uh, if you follow along with my other videos, the very first iteration of Nirvana, which obviously wasn't Nirvana at the time, uh, I don't even think they had a name, was Kurt Cobain, Chris Novoselic, and Bob McFadden on drums. He was a jazz drummer in the high school band. They didn't much like him. He was kind of a jockey type, but he was the only person they knew with drums and he was good. So they started practicing for a couple months in Marine. Maria's beauty shop, Chris Mother's Salon, and Chris and Shelly decide they're going to move to Arizona in search of better work. This is actually what broke up the very first iteration of Nirvana. But you'll learn what happened right now. But they soon tired of the stifling, relentless heat and all those Republicans and moved back to the $100 a month apartment. They were only in Arizona for six months. When they came back, Nirvana resumed with a different drummer, Aaron Burkhardt. They stayed there for six months before moving to an apartment in nearby Hoquiam. Kristen Shelley went to Arizona, stayed there for six months, 
decided the grass was not greener on the other side, came back to the $100 a month apartment in Aberdeen, stayed there six months, then moved to Hoquiam. This is when Chris starts getting very serious about the band Nirvana. They became vegetarians. Chris got turned on to the idea by a friend from work named Dwight Covey, a hip older guy who had built a cabin for himself out in the woods and used no electricity or running water. Chris quit eating red meat then gradually dropped poultry and fish. I was just looking for a better way to live, I guess. I started thinking about all the cows slaughtered. It just seemed like a really good thing to do. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Chris Novoselic's short chapter. You'll see the next chapter is about the Melvins, and we will get into the really good stuff. And don't worry, I won't leave you hanging. We'll get this done within the next few days or week. I am working on two other videos, a part two of Jeffrey Epstein and a part three of the time Nirvana spent with Steve Albini recording Nirvana in utero. I hope you guys are looking forward to those. We've got some awesome things coming up in October, but as I said, there will be a couple more videos coming out this month. If you've never subscribed, go ahead, hit the subscription, turn on your notifications, and if you learned something new, leave me a like. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. <laughs>